As we look at the scriptures that were shared this morning, we can see there's quite a contrast between the experience that the Israelites endured at the base of Mount Sinai where the people were so scared that they asked Moses to speak to God personally rather than having to endure the voice of God. And the experience that the author of Hebrews foreshadows for us as we approach Mount Zion, the heavenly city of God. The Hebrews passage pictures an experience we can look forward to as we are now, as we come into the presence of Jesus in heaven and are now under the new covenant promise of God's grace. But the Old Testament passage focuses on the Old Covenant made at the time of the Ten Commandments. The Israelites had only a fearful expectation of judgment, the untouchable mountain, the terrifying warning, the severe penalties, the specter of thunder and lightning, smoke and flame, unearthly trumpet blasts, as the whole mountain shook with a violent earthquake. Has anybody here experienced an earthquake? What was that like, Bob? We slept through it. He slept through it. Okinawa, and it was very frightening. The whole house was shaking, and it was so bad I couldn't walk. Okay. Who else over here? You have to. My father was with us in my brother's home in California, and uh, seven o'clock in the morning, the whole house shook. It was really scary. Anyone else? Wendy. Loma Prieta in San Francisco. Okay, and, and how did you feel? We were at school and we were looking for places to duck and cover and I couldn't believe it when they said that the bridge collapsed and we saw it on the monitor and it was all true. Okay. For those of you who've experienced an earthquake, would it be safe to say that you felt shaken to the core? And for most of you, would say it's an experience you don't want to endure again. I myself have never experienced an earthquake. But back in Minnesota, one time, as I was getting ready to go to bed, I felt a strange sensation, like someone had turned on a full body vibrator for just a second. My stomach did a flip flop and I felt very disconcerting for just a little bit. The next day I found out that a fertilizer plant in a town 12 miles away had exploded. Evidently the impact of that explosion followed the bedrock to my bedroom and gave me the sensation that I felt shaken to the core. But you know, it doesn't have to be physical stimuli to have that feeling. I can recall having that same feeling back when I was in college. My organic medicinals instructor liked to write the scores on the blackboard before he was turning back the papers. This morning he wrote down a 93 is the high score a 79 is the average score, and a 68 as the low score, which he circled and said, some of you students have to put forth a greater effort. Now, I wasn't the least bit concerned about my score. I'm sure I had done well until I opened my test paper and found out that I was the circled 68 on the board, the lowest 
score in the class. I can tell you it's a good thing I was sitting down because I couldn't have stood to that. I was truly shaken to the core. Now you might say to me, Gary, what's the big deal about a test that you took decades ago? I know it's hard to believe it's decades ago that I was in school. But, <laughs> but look at me. Every one of you has something different, like perhaps you were driving down the road, maybe a little faster than you should have been, and all of a sudden you see the light flashing in your rearview mirror. Uh, the officer may have been nice, but you still got a ticket. And you were so shaken that you started to cry. Or maybe you got called at the principal's office because your daughter, yeah, your daughter, was acting out. You were so shaken that you felt like you were the one in trouble. Or perhaps... You just found out that your daughter's reserve unit got called up. It's going to be deployed to a war zone. You're so shaken. Or your supervisor tells you at work that there's probably going to be layoffs. You just bought a house. Now this, you're shaken to the core. Or perhaps you went to visit your mother at the nursing home and you had to remind her who you were. You're shaken. Perhaps your husband has to go undergo a medical procedure and you're thinking, how can this happen again? You're shaken to the core. I look back in the choir loft to the chair that was my dear friend Offie's. Life is so fragile and I am shaken. We all have situations and circumstances that spin us out of control as we get caught up in a whirlwind of doubt. We're like the Israelites at Mount Sinai who approached the mountain with fear and dread. Darkness, gloom, and storm terrorize us. We cannot bear what we're facing. We fall back. We tremble with fear. We're shaken to the core. I am with you. I am with you. Like Elijah on the side of the mountain, we hear that gentle whisper, I am with you. Like David the psalmist, we can take refuge in the fact that he will grant us peace. I am with you. Like the songwriter, we can say, even though it's still raining, through the storm, I hear you say, I am with you. Now you might say, wait a minute, God. How are you with me? I'm feeling awfully alone right now. There's a lot of stuff in my life that I'm going through. How are you being manifested? How are you showing yourself to me? That answer is in verses 22 through 24 of our reading from Hebrews today, where God indicates that there are six ways that he's manifesting himself to us. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels, in joyful assembly. You have come to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits 
of the righteous made perfect to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood that speaks better, a better word than the blood of Abel. I am with you. I am with you through the church, your Christian family and friends here on earth, who in Galatians 6 are called on to carry one another's burdens. Human friendship in which we bear one another's burdens is part of the purpose of God for his people. We are called out to reach out to others, to recognize their needs, to give of our blessings so we might bless others. And we can also be blessed by this ourselves. We should not keep burdens to ourselves, but rather seek out loving Christian friends who will help us to bear our burdens. In the Lord of the Ring trilogy, Frodo, who has done all that he can to destroy the Ring of Power, finally says, I can't go on anymore. But Sam, his constant companion, sees a solution. I may not be able to carry the ring, Mr. Frodo, but I can carry you. That's how we as Christians should be to one another. We can't always carry one another's burdens, but we can carry one another. We can lift them up in prayer. We can be there during their darkest times and make sure no one gets left behind, feeling all alone and deserted. I am with you. Through thousands upon thousands of angels. Think of that number. Whatever number you imagine, it's not big enough. According to the Talmud, everyone has two ministering angels by their side their entire life. Isn't that a comforting thought? Angels do more than act as God's messengers and observe human affairs. They're also involved in protecting God's people in times of great need. Psalm 91, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. Hebrews 1.14 says of angels, are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Angels can help to encourage you and assure you as they did Mary. Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. Knowing that angels guard us can ease our concerns in life. We have no way of knowing how often our feet are directed to the right path, nor how often we've been guarded from harm. But we can trust that they are ever-present. If there's a struggle in your life and you're in prayer, stay on your knees before God because he will send angels to minister on your behalf to comfort you and cheer you, to comfort you and care for you. I am with you through the redeemed in heaven. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We each have great examples of faith who teach us how to live lives of faith. A parent, or a teacher, a minister, or a friend whose life we could hope to emulate. Before them, there were the saintly lives of the early Christians, the great reformers, missionaries who lived lives of sacrifice, some even unto death. All of these past lives are there for us to draw on as we face our own trials. A coach might say to us, others made it through this, so can you. So 
So we should, following that example, compete to complete our own spiritual race. This cloud of witnesses, much like the pillar of cloud in Israelite history, serves to lead us. We are led onward and upward by their examples of faith. I am with you through the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, like the hope of glory, is a help in the midst of hardship. The Holy Spirit is a full person of the Trinity. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, and present in every place. The Spirit is an indispensable friend to every Christian. Romans 8.26 states that as hope sustains the believer in suffering, so the Spirit helps him in prayer. Sometimes in life, the sin and destruction that we experience can leave us speechless. Sometimes we don't know how to pray, not even knowing what to ask for or even what we truly need. But there is an intensity to the prayer offered by the Holy Spirit on our behalf which reaches beyond merely receiving an audience with God. His intercession reaches beyond mere petition and appeal. The Spirit's response of sighs too deep for words show how God, through his Spirit, addresses our needs. We can endure because of the Spirit's help. I am with you. Through Jesus himself, one of the main things Jesus is, is compassion. He cares for his people. Cast all your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. Jesus sees the needs of his people, and he responds. If he provides for the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, don't you believe he cares enough to meet your needs? 1 Peter 5, 7 echoes this thought. Listen to that verse in the Amplified Version. Cast all your cares, your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all on him, for he cares about you with deepest affection and watches over you very carefully. We can bring Jesus the good, the bad, and the ugly, all of it. And he, in turn, gives us his peace. I am with you. Almighty God, the very creator of all that is known and unknown, looks down on this tiny corner of the universe, this little blue planet, to right where you are. He knows you by name. And he has loved you for all time. He has been your hope and confidence since your youth. And he will not forsake you even when you are old and gray. He knows your needs. And he knows you've been shaken. And he calls to you. Come, I am your rock, your fortress, your deliverer. Come, I have made a place of refuge for you. This is the God that desires to connect with each one of you this morning. This is the God that says he will not leave you or forsake you. This is the God that will restore you. This is the God who has promised you a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Amen. Almighty and loving God, we bless you for the gift of your word. For the promise of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We pray now for the grace to believe what we have heard and to live in ways that honor you above all. 
through Christ our Lord. Amen.